Okay, well, it's seven o'clock in New York, midnight in London, and in Jerusalem, it's two in the morning. Let's get started. Two days ago, late on Saturday evening, Iran launched 170 drones, 300, uh, excuse me, 30 cruise missiles, and 120 ballistic missiles at Israel. Among the targets was the Nevatim Air Base, southeast of the Negev city of Beersheba, where Israel's fleet of F-35 Adir fighter jets are housed. Saturday's attack is an Iranian escalation in a war, sometimes warmer, sometimes colder, that it has waged against Israel and America for some four decades. But it also represents a new dimension of that war, whereas most of Iran's attacks have been conducted through proxy forces, the Houthis in Yemen, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad in the Palestinian territories, and various militia groups in Iraq, this past Saturday's attack was the first one direct from Iran itself against Israel. Soon after the initial barrage was launched, a coalition of Israeli, British, and American pilots shot drones and missiles out of the sky, and French, Jordanian, and reportedly even Saudi assets mobilized to prevent some of, well, really most of these weapons from hitting Israeli targets. Aside from the skill of these airmen, Israel also deployed in really an astonishing way its multi-tiered missile defense technology weaving together the Iron Dome, David Sling, and Aero 3 systems. Israelis and friends of Israel everywhere owe a debt of gratitude to these courageous pilots and to the skill and, and uh, ingenuity of the women and men who devised and operated the technology that shielded the Jewish state from devastation on Sunday. Now it's up to us to try to understand the meaning of this attack in the context of Israel's wars, in the context of Iran's strategic concept, in the context of American leadership in the Middle East, and what implications it will have in that geopolitical arena and for other theaters of conflict in Europe and in Asia. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this evening's briefing. My name is Jonathan Silver. I'm the Warren R. Stern Senior Fellow of Jewish Civilization at Tikva and the editor of Mosaic. And I'm joined by two distinguished experts in the Middle East and its security. Ray Take is a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and the author of many essays and articles and even books about Iran and the Middle East. And Elliot Abrams, Tikva's chairman, formerly the deputy White House National Security Advisor, and most recently, Secretary Pompeo's special representative for Iran. Later in the hour, we, we expect to be joined by uh, Tom Cotton, Senator of Arkansas, who, among other distinctions, sits on the Armed Services Committee and the Intelligence Committee of the U.S. Senate. Before we start, let me just thank, well, all of you, some 5,500 members of our TICFA community who are joining us this evening, as well as our co-sponsors at the National Review Institute and at the Public Interest Fellowship. I'd like to start, gentlemen, first by discussing Iran, then hopefully we'll connect with Senator Cotton. I know he's running between different obligations this evening, and then we'll come back to discuss Israel and the U.S.-Israel relationship. Ray, I'd like to start with you, if you can just dimension for us how you understand Iranian objectives and what you think they hope to achieve in launching this attack. Uh, thank you very much. First, I want to thank you for hosting our me. Uh, thank Tikvapan for uh, putting this very important event and all the people who have tuned in to listen to what we have to say and hopefully are being instructed. I want to begin by saying that something happened on Saturday that hadn't happened in 45 years. This was a direct confrontation between Israel and Iran. Usually, as I think Jonathan mentioned, Iran relied on proxies and other ways of, of, of uh, committing uh, crimes against Israel. Terrorism was an instrument of choice. This was a direct attack. And this was a direct attack intending on killing a large number of people, uh, which we'll mercifully get missed. Uh, so we're in a new situation here. The old Islamic Republic really doesn't apply here. Uh, so what can we say about this new situation over here and what, as far as one can tell, uh, for, provoke this particular action? Uh, first of all, it is entirely possible that the Iranian leadership believed that Israel was too involved in Gaza, too preoccupied with pacification of that particular enclave to be able to measurably respond to an Iranian attack, particularly at the time when there's some degree of international scrutiny and natural pressure on Israel in terms of the war in Gaza. Second, they may have noticed that there is some degree of divisions between the United States and Israel, 
uh, as that has become more obvious in the past couple of months. And perhaps they thought that those cleavages were one way to be exploited. And therefore, the United States itself that has telegraphed widely and loudly that it does not want international to conflict in the Middle East would act as some sort of a restraint on Israel should this even have led to a larger set of casualties. Uh, finally, I would say that what we're seeing today in Iran is, uh, and this has been talked about by many others, is succession. But when we think of succession, we think of succession to the top post, the post of the Supreme Leader. This is succession happening throughout the system, throughout the national security establishment, because of the purges and people being excised from, from the body politic. So there's a new group of people coming in. Uh, and President Raisi kind of embodies them. They tend to be reckless. Uh, they tend to be uh, they tend to be more ideological, more strident, more parochial. And they may have a different perspective on how to essentially engage in international relations and in terms of the level of uh, the level of uh, confrontation that they would like to have with the state of Israel. So all these factors probably play into it uh, as Iran launched what is, after all, a profoundly reckless act, which which it, which is still on hold. But and, and if you had to say, what what do you think that they wanted to achieve? Uh, well, based upon what I say, to kill a large number of people. And essentially, this might have been a lot of pressure coming from the security services about avenging the death of General uh, General Zahedi. And you begin to see, once you rely on Revolutionary Guards and former members of the Revolutionary Guard to staff your national security bureaucracy, you may have this kind of recklessness. There is a kind of a shadow war that is taking place between Israel and Iran for a while, Syria being the principal platform of that. So they might have essentially decided that this is the right time to inflict a mass casualty event on Israel and therefore build up their own deterrence. Uh, as I said, this history of international relations in some ways is a history of misperceptions. And that's how a lot of conflicts begin. And this, this certainly was a misreading of the situation. But that's how we see it. From their perspective, may not be misreading of the situation. And so far, they have essentially attacked Israel in a symbolic way. And, you know, things are not all that bad as far as they're, they're celebrating it. They're celebrating their attack internally and so forth. Okay, Elliot, we'll come to you in just a moment. I understand yep. that Senator Cotton is available. Yeah. So uh, let's see if we can get him. There he is. Senator Cotton, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Jonathan. Thanks for having me on. So listen, I've got a bunch of questions for you about how this looks from the Senate and your own view. But why don't you just begin by explaining, just as a geostrategic thinker, what you think happened on Saturday night? Well, I think it's not much more complicated than what Ray said. What did they want to do? They wanted to kill a bunch of people, specifically a, a bunch of Israelis. Um, in addition, they probably would have killed some Americans as well. Um, I, I think they viewed it as a critical imperative for them not to lose face after what they called attack on their own territory in Syria. Uh, at a constant, I would dispute that. I would say it was a, a planning cell for Revolutionary Guard Corps attacks. Um, even the Biden White House, which has done everything it can to conciliate and appease Iran and to try to avoid this kind of exchange of fire between Iran and Israel, has been saying for 48 hours now, publicly and privately, that this was not some uh, uh, effort by Iran to demonstrate resolve, but not actually inflict any damages. I mean, when you fire more than 300 drones and missiles at a country, I think by definition, you are trying to kill a lot of people and destroy a lot of their critical sites. That's one reason why they uh, were aiming at this air base. So I don't think there's any doubt what Iran was trying to do here. And uh, again, I, I wouldn't presume to tell Benjamin Netanyahu or his war cabinet or the Israeli people writ large in their elected government how they were, should respond to this. It, it is hard to imagine any nation not taking retaliatory action when they're shot at with 300 missiles and drones. It, it's specifically hard given Israel's neighborhood and the ring of fire that Iran has erected, erected around it. And now this red line that has crossed for the first time in decades of actually 
targeting Israel from its own territory. It's difficult to imagine that they won't respond, and I suspect that that respond will, response could be pretty intensive. Now, they'll do it in a method and a timing of their choice. All I know is that we as America should back Israel to the hilt in this. I think right now, probably public perceptions of Israel and America, but especially around the world, have changed somewhat. The attack has reminded uh Viewers who may not be as deeply engaged as everyone in the audience here tonight is that Israel is the victim here. Israel is the target um, by Iran, its proxy network. They're not the aggressor. Uh, it's probably also helped remind so many of these Arab nations why they have trended in Israel's direction over the last 10 or 15 years, that Israel, to borrow a phrase, is the strong force in the region. And anything less than what we saw on Saturday night of the defense of its own territory and probably anything less than a very strong response to this might cause some of those Arab leaders to think, well, maybe Israel is not as strong as we thought, or maybe they're not as able to withstand political pressure from Europe or even from Washington in a democratic administration. So I think all those things point in the direction of a strong and forceful Israeli response, um, and the United States should back Israel to the hilt. And in that effort to back Israel to the hilt, what do you think that the Senate can do in particular, especially, as you've said, since there seems to be a different direction, a different concept which the executive branch is taking toward the conflict. What well, would help if Chuck Schumer, the majority leader of the Senate, would stop calling for new elections in Israel in the middle of a shooting war. Um, one thing that we can stress, though, is all the actions that President Biden has taken the last three and a half years um, that has encouraged Iran, that has emboldened Iran. It's not just his rhetoric over the last few months as he's continued to criticize Israel and had his White House aides leak to the media about how angry he is or how Israel is doing this, that, or the other thing wrong. I mean, still to this day, you know, six months after the worst attack on the Jewish people since the Holocaust, two days since Iran attacked Israel directly, he still has a waiver in effect for sanctions that provides Iran more than $10 billion. He still is not apparently pressing European nations to invoke snapback sanctions under the flawed nuclear deal still allowing 1.4 billion barrels of oil a day to flow out of Iran and into uh, the IRGC and the Quds Force coffers. So he says he wants diplomatic responses. He doesn't want a military response. Okay, that's fine. Well, those are a few diplomatic options right away. But again, you have White House officials on background saying that they're not going to do any of those things. And in the Senate, but especially in the House, where we have the initiative, since we have the majority, uh, we need to put the pressure on, on Biden to do exactly that thing. Or the House could send us legislation to that effect, and we could again put pressure on Chuck Schumer uh, to pass it. If the House sends us legislation this week that will provide the long stalled aid to Israel, and, and I'd say whatever form it comes over, again, we need to put the pressure on Chuck Schumer to bring that up for a vote promptly. I want to ask about something that you said and ask you to, to, uh, to tell us more about your thinking about this, and, and that is the standing of Israel in the American public overall. When you're in Arkansas, when you're talking to Americans across the country, I mean, it, it, um, polls suggest that that the assessment of Israel, that the favorability of Israel has declined because of its operations in Gaza. And I wonder how that limits you, what opportunities you think exist to try to remind the American people of of our allies. Well, in Arkansas, I mean, I'll just say that when I say we should back Israel to the hilt, or as far as I'm concerned, Israel can bounce the rubble in Gaza if that's what it takes to kill Hamas. Um, I generally am speaking as the voice of moderation um, and, <laughs> and, and caution. Most Arkansans that I talk to would probably be even tougher on this matter. Um, you, you have seen, regrettably, a, a large number uh, of the American left moving decisively against Israel. And that's why you see Joe Biden taking some of the strident uh, or making some of the strident criticism he has, or Chuck Schumer, again, calling for new elections and a Democratic ally, because they're trying to placate that large anti-Israel, even anti-Semitic element in their party. Um, but just normal Americans, even if they don't follow Middle Eastern politics, they couldn't point out where the West Bank is or what river it's the West Bank of, they understand, as I said at the outset, that, that Israel is the victim here of this aggression. Israel is not the aggressor. They're engaged in an existential war to defend themselves. Um, I had got a message Sunday morning uh, from a friend um, in Arkansas. Again, he's not deeply engaged in politics or 
travels the region or anything. He's never worked in diplomacy or in Washington. But he said the phrase take the win, as Biden said, is deeply offensive and that he can't imagine any nation ever taking the win of being shot at with 300 missiles and drones. Of course, when we hear the Iranians talk about this conflict, we hear them talk about Israel as the lesser Satan and about our country, the United States, as the great Satan. And it sort of leads me to think the extent to which we Americans ought to see a direct attack on our ally like this as, in a sense, an attack on the coalition that we lead and the the extent to which we ought to consider the role that America has in trying to reestablish our own deterrence in the region. How do you think about that? Well, there's no question Israel has, or I'm sorry, that Iran has had that view for 45 years now. They've long called Israel the little Satan and the United States the great Satan because they do view um, Israel as this outpost uh, of Western civilization in their land uh, and the source of all that's wrong there. And and in some ways, it's a continuation of the battle of Western ideas that you saw in much of the 20th century in Europe. I mean, so much of the radicalism in, in the Middle East, whether it's of the Sunni version of the Shiite version, it is or has historic roots, at least in demented Western ideologies, Marxism or fascism or communism that was grafted into the region on top of the Islamic faith uh, in the early 20th century. So in some ways, it's a continuation of the battle of Western ideas that Western ideas, you know, that were best embodied in the United States and still are, and that are also embodied by nations like Israel or Great Britain or what have you. And on the other hand, um, some of the ideologies that caused so much death and destruction in the 20th century. But there's no question that Iran views it in that ideological way. Um, it just so happens that Israel is closer and they're smaller and they're an easier target than it is to hit the United States. Um, but make no mistake, Iran views us as, as one and the same. Uh, in this ideological battle, and that's why. And in even, fact, its proxies did, have targeted our soldiers no less than than Israeli assets. Yeah, when we did have large numbers of soldiers and countries on their border, they killed hundreds of them for that for that reason. And that even if we didn't view it as an ideological battle, Iran does, a and frankly, much of our network of partners and allies in the region does as well. So. You know, Joe Biden could say, like, oh, it's not that, you know, we need to de-escalate. We're trying to, you know, back out of the region. We want to be an offshore balancer and, you know, pivot to Asia and every other hackneyed phrase they'd ever used. But all Israel and our allies and our enemies see is an America that is losing its resolve, first among Barack Obama, first with Barack Obama and now with Joe Biden. You know, um, President Biden, like several presidents before him, have, have all intoned in very pious statements that they will never allow Iran to mm. acquire a nuclear weapon on their watch. So first, I guess, just in, as an empirical matter, how close is that to happening? And second, what do you think it would require for the United States to stand up to that promise? Well, uh, first off, I'm not sure that Barack Obama and Joe Biden are genuine in that promise. I know it'll shock you to hear that I have a question about their good faith. Um, or what they might mean is that they would not allow or they would take steps to prevent Iran from actually assembling a nuclear weapon. Now, those steps might be abject appeasement and bribery to not do it on their watch. So it would happen on Donald Trump's watch or some other Republican president. But they would be perfectly fine if Iran got all the way up to the very edge of having a nuclear weapon, as long as they didn't like, you know, couple pieces together and turn the screwdriver, so to speak, they would declare victory and they had stopped Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. So that's kind of the way I view their so-called promise on that regard. Unfortunately, we don't have great insight into Iran's progress uh, towards a nuclear weapon because they've kicked out IEA inspectors um, and they've continued to pace during the Biden administration uh, because the Biden, President Biden tried to get back into the nuclear deal for at least the first two years of his administration. But we know they're a lot closer than they were when Joe Biden took office. They may have enough fissile material to actually create one or more weapons. There may be some steps left in the in the designs and the manufacturing of that. I mean, this is not a simple thing to do, but it probably is given enough time within their capabilities to do so. And, and while it's a grave threat to American national security for Iran to have a nuclear weapon, it's an existential threat um, for Israel. You know, as Mahmoud Adinejad used to say, you know, Israel is just a one bomb nation, by which he meant 
that one bomb could destroy Israel. Um, and that's the mindset of the Ayatollahs. And you know, I think if you're sitting in, in Jerusalem, um, you can't be nearly as sanguine about Iran being in this gray indeterminate zone of nuclear progress as Joe Biden seems to be. As you, if no, I the, can just jump in for a minute. Yeah, Elliot, please. <clears throat> as you <clears throat> think about the Iranian nuclear, potential nuclear weapon, if a president, Biden or any other, said, <clears throat> that's intolerable, we're going to prevent it, and orders military action to prevent it, do you think Americans, I guess, in and out of Arkansas, would actually would support that? I do believe so. I, I think you know, President Biden doesn't have a lot of credibility on these issues because of his conduct of foreign policy over the last three plus years. Um, but a, a determined and resolute president with the backing of Israel and our Arab allies in the region, um, who said that we had to take military action to prevent Iran, which is on the precipice of getting a nuclear weapon, um, would be greeted with much support nationwide. Uh, again, um, my views on Iran, I, I do not think are out of step with most Arkansans and frankly, most normal Americans. Uh, of course, they don't want another 20 year war in Iran. They don't want to invade Iran and occupy it and try to change its mm -hmm. culture and history and system of government. Um, but they also see what happened on Saturday night and imagine how much worse it would be if Iran had nuclear weapons. Not even if Iran had used those nuclear weapons, but if Iran simply had a nuclear umbrella under which to operate. Um, and, I mean, and I mean, just look at the way this president reacts to fairly, fairly non-credible nuclear threats coming from various Russian officials in Ukraine. Imagine if those threats were coming from the crazed Ayatollahs in Tehran, whose own kind of worldview actually might lead them to use a nuclear weapon. John, I think, I think again, the support would be there. I mean, in, I could cite numerous examples, you know, in the Middle East and around the world in mm. recent decades where decisive, resolute presidents who took targeted, discriminate military action to remove a specific threat, uh, again, widespread support from the American people. I just, I can't ask one question, mm -hmm. Senator Coffey. You serve on the intelligence committee. Uh, and what we saw here is an event that's unprecedented in 45 years of tension and conflict between Israel and Iran. So something is happening within Iran that's very different than it was before Friday in terms of leadership structure, in terms of national security decision making. Were you satisfied with the intelligence community's assessment of this change in Iran that made an extraordinary decision? Well, Ray, I want to be careful about how I'm discussing this. Um, I'll say that, uh, you know, the media reports that predicted this um, were not a surprise to me when the media reports began. So in, in one regard, um, the, the kind of tactical or immediate battlefield warning uh, was successful, both with Israel and the United States um, on our intelligence communities understanding and insight into Iranian leadership, as in many countries around the world, unfortunately. Now, I can't say I'm terribly satisfied. Um, I think that's in part because, I mean, it's not, as they always say, leadership plans and intentions are hard to discern. And that's right, because leaders of countries like China and Russia and Iran go to great lengths to not reveal those things. Um, so it's hard to crack into those circles. At the same time, you know, one thing I've I always kind of believe before I got into the Senate and on the Intelligence Committee, and I believe even more firmly now, is, you know, you don't have to have, you know, the the Ayatollah's home nurse or Vladimir Putin's valet or Xi Jinping's butler on CIA's payroll to understand what their intentions are. They usually kind of tell you in advance. I mean, Vladimir Putin gave that speech on the eve of his invasion of Ukraine in February of 22, which was really nothing but a, like a spoken version of an essay he had published in the summer of 2021. Likewise, he marshaled 200,000 troops on Ukraine's border. There's oftentimes simply putting two and two together and, and not trying to delude yourself that something comfortable or pre preferable is happening or the, the favorable outcome, even though it's unlikely, is the one that is likely to happen based on the words and the actions that national leaders uh, undertake. So again, I don't think you actually have to be up on 
these leaders' telephones or computers, if they use them or have someone in their personal circle on the CIA payroll, to have a pretty good indication of what's going on and what they're likely to do. Uh, if, I can, if I can, I'll be very brief, though. Uh, given the recklessness and boldness of the Iranian decision on this issue, should we revisit their nuclear calculations? Namely, we have always said they haven't made the decision to assemble a bomb, they want to stop short of the threshold. Are all those arguments no longer valid today? Uh, oh, I've never believed those arguments. I think that those are <laughs> politically convenient conclusions. Um, that again, often tells you it tells the story that you you want to hear. And just to give you another example, a couple months ago, there's a story I think in Bloomberg News that Xi Jinping had fired uh, most of the senior leaders of his rocket forces due to widespread corruption. You know, for instance, you know, um, rockets and or missiles that were supposed to have rocket fuel in them had water in them, things like that. Empty silos where they were supposed to have missiles in them. Um, I don't doubt any of that happened. Uh, the Chinese military can be very corrupt. But the conclusion then was this will set back their nuclear uh, you know, buildup several years, make it less likely that they'll be ready to invade Taiwan with a larger nuclear umbrella by 2027. I don't think that necessarily follows from the fact of corruption at all. I think what it is, are people in Washington telling themselves a convenient story. And anytime intelligence analysis leads you to a comfortable, convenient policy conclusion, you ought to raise questions about it. Doesn't mean it's wrong, but as Churchill said about civil military relations, it's always right to probe. And if those conclusions are leaked to the media, then you really ought to raise questions about it because it serves a clear political purpose. Again, doesn't mean it's wrong, but you should always probe on the evidence. And I've never believed the evidence about these convenient conclusions on Iran's nuclear intentions are supported uh, or is supportable. Senator Cotton, I'm very grateful for your time. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you all for having me. Bye-bye. So, Elliot, I want to I want to get back to something that you've written and spoken about in recent weeks and months, which has to do with uh, assessment of the Iranian conduct of its foreign policy over the last many years. Mm. If you really look back at the last decade or so, Iran's kind of been on a roll. They have um, they have been able to build up their proxy forces in impressive ways. They have been able to finally get out of way from the the uh, Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign. Money is flowing in. It seems like an awful lot to put at risk in a maneuver like this. Well, I do think they've had a very successful foreign policy going back, say, two decades. It has included, as the senator said, killing Americans uh, for decades um, without really really being uh, hurt, punished by the United States for doing that. And, you know, like we can add to your list, they now have a very fruitful relationship with Russia. Um, and at least in terms of oil sales with China. Um, so the question is, why would they risk it? If you take it, and I do, that this was not a demonstration over the weekend. It was a murderous attack on Israel which not only was trying to hurt Israel's military capability at the F-35s at Nevatim Air Base, but to kill lots of Israelis. That would have, one assumes, led to a significant Israeli attack. Why? Now, I've been asking myself that question for several days, because to me, this attack was a surprise for that reason. You know, I think if I were an Iranian strategist, I'd say, well, if we're going to build a nuclear weapon, let's wait until we have the nuclear weapon. Um, I understand the other arguments that, well, Israel's position in the world seems to be down now. People are criticizing it since the Gaza war. The Biden administration is criticizing it. Maybe now is the right time. But not to do what they seem to have been trying to do. The only, uh, I've heard a lot of people discuss this. No one's ever come up with an answer except the answer that Ray just gave. That is, you know, when we say, what is Iran trying to, it's not Iran. It's a certain small group of leadership cadres. And uh, as Ray, I think, 
suggested in his question to the senator, you know, we're not talking about what does Foreign Minister Zarif think or say when he is talking to Westerners. He's no longer foreign minister. The question really is, well, who's running the show now? And there may be a change of the more significant elites in a much more radical direction. And the criticism that I would offer of U.S. policy uh, now is that we don't seem to be willing to rethink our Iran policy. Um, we, we've treated Iran, and you know, candidly for me, this begins with the JCPOA in 2015. President Obama told uh, our Arab, Arab allies they need to learn to share the region with Iran. <clears throat> that was a view of an Iran that would be lured and bribed into responsible behavior. And I think that view is wrong. And I think what we saw this weekend shows who the people running Iran are, just as the invasion of, Iran, of Ukraine showed us who Vladimir Putin is. That ought to get us to recalculate, a, and I would think a much tougher Iran policy. So if, as both of you have suggested, this was not performative, but actually an attempt to cause real damage to Israeli infrastructure, Israeli military targets, and Israeli civilians, and Israeli civilian targets. If that's so, Ray, is there any indication that you can uh, detect of what Iran thought would happen next? Not, not in terms of the public records, but I would say Senator Cotton made a very important point. We talk a lot about intelligence assessment, but sometimes it's useful to listen to what people are saying. Ali Khamenei has given speech after speech saying America is a decadent and weak power that is tired of Middle East conflicts and is eager to forfeit its patrimony. He speaks often about Israel divided against itself, divided against, uh, divided in the international community, and at odds with his principal ally, the United States. And he often speaks about and people around him speak about the success of Iran's revolutionary message and his determination to project the revolution forward. This is not an intelligence assessment. This is a textual assessment. Mm. And, and by the way, I read every Ali Khamenei speech because they're in English. <laughs> they're translated into five, six languages. He wants you to know what he's talking about. And what I have found unsatisfactory about the way you study this country, about the way I study this country, and I think Elliot and I had an occasion to talk about that recently, is existing assumptions no longer apply. And I thought that in the conversation that we had with other gentlemen a while back, that they didn't apply before this conflict. Mm. Because there is a transition of leadership happening. This is not to suggest that Ali Khamenei, Ali Larjani, and the previous elite were comprehensible to us. This is not to suggest that yet we have mastered Iranian politics. But the dark cube of Iranian politics is darker today. There are people coming to power that we don't know, and we don't know how to access their global view, their internal contradictions, their rivalries, their alliances. So we are going to a very dangerous situation with this country with less understanding of his politics than any time in the past. Again, this is not a, in any way indication of self grandizement I've been looking at this for 25 years, and I think I know less about Iran today than at any point in the past. I think we're in a new place, and we just don't seem to fully understand it because we don't understand what this new thing is. I would agree with Elliot in one respect. The United States and maybe the international community is locked into 2005. In 2005, our goal was arms control. Our means of coordinating Iran to agree to those the arms control was economic penalties, and our preferred modality was multinational, multilateral. None of those three, three, three things apply today. The era of arms control is over. I do think in some way we have exaggerated the impact of sanctions, particularly given the advent of the China trade and great power patronage. And the multilateral forums are no longer available to us because of Russia and China. 
and the absence of great power consensus on this issue. So, and so we're in 2005, and everybody else has moved on. The Iranians have moved on, the Russians have moved on, the Chinese have moved on. <laughs> we're just stuck in the past. This is not a criticism of anybody. It's a criticism of everybody, including me. <laughs> we have to start thinking about this in a very new way. We're dealing with a very radical and militant and parochial and hardcore revolutionary elite who have displayed an unusual degree of boldness in this, of this attack on Israel. This attack of Israel was an indication of their international boldness. It was not a one-off thing. And I want to see where else are they going to be bold. What I'd be looking at is, are they about to cross the nuclear threshold if they have this capacity to do so? I just want to suggest once more time as I finish this, we're in a new situation today. You know, uh, it's, it's um, great that Saturday didn't work out for the Iranians, but that doesn't that doesn't change the fact that we're in a new situation. Um, it's interesting that just following on directly in what you said about the need for us to think anew. This is precisely what has happened to Israel after October 7. That is, they had a view of Hamas. And they had that view for, let's say, 20 years. And um, what they found out was that it was wrong. And now they're telling themselves, okay, we, we don't actually, it is not intelligent for us to spend our time thinking about what's in their heads. Have we deterred them? Have we have deterred them? We have to think about their capabilities. Um, to me, uh, this means many things. I mean, one of them is, uh, just on the Israel part, this attack over the weekend, I think, uh, confirms Israeli leaders in their view that they must eventually go into Rafah and complete the destruction of Hamas as a fighting force. Um, I think it also strengthens the view of those who say, um, ultimately, we are going to have to take on Hezbollah because that combination of Hezbollah and Iran uh, is too dangerous to live with. We will have eliminated one of these proxies in this Iranian effort to surround Israel, but the others still exist, and that may be too dangerous to live with. I just say one other thing. As we think about this as Americans, and we think about Putin, and we think about the great 21st century challenge of China. And then we think about the Middle East. It seems to me that like the Israelis, we're going, we really are going to need a larger defense budget and a larger defense establishment. We need more ships and we need new planes and we may need more uh, soldiers. We just saw what happened because of our ability to put destroyers near Israel at a critical moment. In fact, you know, we, the United States shot down, I think we claim, 80 drones. Well, we weren't there. Now, maybe the Israelis would have shot down all 80. One hopes so. But uh, we've got to think about the projection of power, I think, in, in a new way ourselves. Now, Elliot, the, this change in the conception that has uh, been addressed by the Israeli defense establishment, thinking pr previously about the intentions of the adversary and thinking now instead about the capabilities of the adversary. You see that same division in the American interpretation and questions raised about Saturday's attack. Yeah, we, You have a number of people saying uh, they didn't really mean it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, one has to interrogate their intentions. Right. But the very fact that uh, those intentions, right. um, those intep intentions are open to interpretation, is uh, pales in comparison to the to their capabilities, which we've now seen, and w perhaps have not seen the fullness of. Well, but uh, let me just interrupt at that point. The, the, the great great security threat to Israel is Hezbollah, not Iran, and the reason is geography. Um, you saw with the drones that they had hours of notice. 
They also have significant notice with respect to missiles. It's not that the missiles take so long to get to Israel. They take 10 minutes, I think. But those ballistic missiles, for example, are liquid fueled. They have to be pulled out of underground bunkers. Then they have to be fueled. We see that. Our satellites see that. Presumably Israeli satellites see that. So there's, there's time because there's distance. And a number, uh, Frank McKenzie, the former um, General McKenzie, the former head of CENTCOM, said um, today that he thought that Iran had about 150 ballistic missiles that can reach Israel. So they've used up a lot of them. From that point of view, the real threat is Hezbollah because it's right there. And they don't have that um, distance and protection of of time. That That is, um, I mean, I don't know what a war between Israel and Iran consists of, but the Iranian Air Force is no match for the Israeli Air Force. Uh, missiles, air defense, whichever way you judge it. Um, but uh, his, a war with Hezbollah would be much more damaging for Israel. And, and why do you think Hezbollah was not activated while Israel was confronting this incoming uh, barrage of missiles? I'm going to answer that, but I don't know if Ray will agree with the answer. My answer is Hezbollah's purpose is to deter Israel from bombing the Iranian nuclear sites. And the Iranians are not going to waste it. They're certainly not going to waste it on, from their point of view, Palestinians in Gaza in that war. But they didn't even want to invoke it now. I think it's a kind of special purpose proxy. It's their second strike capability and their deterrent. I largely agree with that. Uh, that, Well, at least I would say I don't have a superior explanation to it. Uh, I don't believe that, as some people suggest, that Nasrallah is his own person and, has, and, and he's a politician, certainly he has some calculation. But one thing we saw with the Syrians' conflict is his Hezbollah will do things that are inconsistent with the interests of Lebanon if the Iranians ask them. Sure. And so if the request had come from Tehran, that I, I think Hezbollah would have activated his force. But I think Elliot is correct, and I, there's nothing I can say to disagree with it, but only affirm it that his bola is retained as an insurance card for Iranian proliferation. Uh, I would say, I think Elliot mentioned that his bola is the greatest immediate danger to Israel. Uh, that's certainly correct. I do worry about this new boldness in Iranian leadership and the prospects of crossing the nuclear threshold. Hmm. Because they just finished doing something profoundly reckless. And yep. apparently, the Israeli actions in Gaza, where they responded aggressively to the attack that took place on October 7, has did not deter them. Yeah. Uh, maybe it hasn't deterred them because Israelis, to be frank, have not managed to succeed in cleansing Gaza of Hamas yet, as, at least as we gather here, speak here today. Maybe they're confident that Israelis will not be able to do so given the divisions in the international community and the scrutiny in the uh, United States and Israeli relations. And I have to say, I'm not an observer of Israeli politics to the same degree of, of, of intimacy that Elliot is, but there is a segment of the American body politics that seems to have really something against Prime Minister Netanyahu. <laughs> <laughs> there is. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a close observer of this relationship. I don't fully understand the enmity they seem to have more of a hostility toward him than Ali Khamenei, <laughs> whom they kind of treat with some degree of deference, the way Kissinger used to treat Mao. Uh, I, I, maybe Elliot can explain it to me. Uh, he's a prime minister in a time of war, from what I see, trying to do the best he can of extraordinary circumstances. Uh, I, I can't say to you what decisions he's made in internal in Israeli politics that were contentious or not. I don't know. <laughs> but they seem to really dislike him. <laughs> I, I haven't seen I, I think, this degree of plotting against an elected democratic ally 
at time of war, maybe it's my own intellectual poverty, maybe I don't know enough history, I, I haven't seen this before. No, I, I think it's correct in this sense. Um, Netanyahu has gotten the enmity, uh, certainly of, of leading Democrats for a very long time. Bill Clinton in his memoirs talks about his efforts to help defeat Netanyahu and I guess it was the 94 election. Um, but um, that was not wartime. That was peacetime. And Israel today, of course, doesn't have a Netanyahu government. It has a war cabinet, uh, Gallant, Gantz, Netanyahu, that is really making the important decisions, at least on war questions and other questions, really have been have been um, pushed aside. Um, whether this will last, I don't know. You know, uh, I mean, how long did the incredible sympathy for Israel last? After October 7th, depending on who you're looking at, it lasted a day, a week, two weeks. There's a lot of sympathy today. There's a lot of support. But I think the thing to look at is, does it translate into anything? That is, every European uh, president or prime minister has said um, since this weekend that they're in solidarity with Israel and they've condemned what Iran did. And now what? I mean, will there be just the simplest thing? Will there be any sanctions on Iran? Is anybody seriously thinking that Britain, France, and uh, uh, Britain and France and Germany uh, should call snapback uh, in the United Nations, which they can do? That is, because of Iran's violations of the nuclear agreement of 2015, all the sanctions come back. No one's even talking about that. So uh, the sympathy is there, and I think there is one good part of it, a much deeper understanding of, I think what Ray just said, that this regime in Iran is reckless, it's dangerous, it's evil. It's a, this is all a reminder of this. Uh, but whether the Europeans, or for that matter, we are willing to do anything remains to be seen. Elliot, let's turn to a couple of questions about Israel itself. Does the, the, your point about the uh, the the quickly dissipating nature of stated sympathy toward Israel at this moment does that factor into the way that Israelis should think about a response and the timing of that response? Yeah, it should factor in, but it should be a small factor. Uh, we're talking about national security, international goodwill is a good thing to have. There is no question about that. It should not be dismissed, but it's not as important as restoring their deterrent. I think part of the problem here on the part, frankly, of the president and those around him, but of all those leaders in Europe is a failure of imagination. They can't think themselves into what it is like to be that tiny country in the Middle East, surrounded in a sense by enemies. Not that Egypt and Jordan are enemies, but certainly in the north, there's an enemy and Iran is building a circle, the ring of fire, as the Israelis call it. They, they, you know, they continue to act as if Israel, <laughs> you know, was between Mexico and, and Canada um, or, or between, you know, Denmark and, I mean, they're not. And so I think the Israelis have to think about this in terms of, Middle Eastern rules. Ray used the expression strong horse, or maybe the senator did. Um, that's right. That's really what matters a lot more. And they can't sacrifice the sense of their country being strong and tough and one that you don't want to take on because the British or the French or the Americans uh, will say, oh, those Israelis, they've, you know, they've gone too far. It's too dangerous to do that. So let's let's just talk about what a retaliatory action might look like. Of course, there are a range of options that the Israelis have before them, a half dozen or so, different sorts of responses that one could imagine. Can you just explain, you know, some of the most obvious ones and what you say, what, Elliot, you see as the trade-offs in thinking about each of them? 
Um, well, the spectrum is very great. And I guess at the far end of it would be an attack on the Iranian nuclear program. Um, and at the low end, it would, it would be nothing, but that's not going to happen. Um, the key decision is whether to hit Iran proper, not Iranian assets. I mean, they could, I've heard people say, I have an Israeli friend who's doing his reserve duty as Miluim, who said, we should now go into Rafa now. Others have said time to go north. You have to have the war with Hezbollah sooner or later. Others, uh, I think other possibilities hit Iranian assets in Iraq or Syria or, or Lebanon and hit them quite hard. Um, hit Iranian assets closer to Iran, let's say in the, in the Gulf. But the key decision is whether to hit Iran. And uh, that is, of course, what I think the um, U.S. is saying don't do. Um, and my guess is that the Israelis will feel they have to do it, that you can't allow Iran to send 300 projectiles into I mean, effort to send them into Israel and not hit back more directly. I think that's the key decision. Then you face the decision of, well, what target? I mean, you could, for example, certain poetic justice hit a drone factory. Hit a drone warehouse. If you hit a drone warehouse, let's say at two in the morning, you would presumably not be trying to uh, maximize the number of people you kill. Um, so th I, there's a very broad range. One part of the calculation is the United States. Not so much what we want or don't want, but if the Iranians hit back again, will we be equally quick to defend Israel? Uh, so I think these are the calculations. And I would say one other thing, candidly. Um, you know, it's been two days and they haven't done it yet. I don't think that's because the United States government is saying, cool it, take the win. Um, I think it's because they're at war in Gaza. People of Israel have been in a traumatic situation since Sukkot since October 7th, and they may, in the government, want people to have the most peaceful or restful Passover they can. So that suggests to me that they may wait from now, um, you know, it would be two weeks. Um, it's not inconceivable to me. I just add one thing to it. The longer the Israeli strike is delayed, the more substantial it has to become. <laughs> well, because if after a month you hit a drone factory, <laughs> I'm not sure if you're actually restoring your deterrent capability. The other thing that Israelis can consider is hitting oil infrastructure. Yeah. Refining capacity, uh, where, where that, that, that is rather vulnerable and it will be economically punitive. And will register a form of sanction that the international community is unwilling to impose. What I don't really know what the answer to, and I think Elliot may have a better idea than I do, is the Israeli target list. Is that is that at the end is going to be a product of negotiations between the United States and Israel, or are the Israelis going to inform the Americans in the aftermath? I mean, given the still, I think quite intimate military to military relationships. Because if you're negotiating with the Americans and you're negotiating within the war cabinet, then that's a lot of interagency meetings to get through. <laughs> it's, it is a lot of negotiating. I mean, we, we've been told that um, Israel has agreed that they would not surprise the United States and that there will be consultations before they go ahead. Um, I think your point about the oil infrastructure is an interesting one. Um, because, again, there's a wide spectrum. You could do a lot of damage or a little damage. You did a little damage, say, to Karg Island, which is the place from which Iran exports most of its oil. Um, you would be reminding the Iranians that should this escalate, they will not export any oil, sanctions or no sanctions, because an enormous amount of damage at Karg Island would have that impact. Um, and that 
you know, it, it's interesting if you think of the, the effects of that in, a, in an odd way that helps Russia. Because it immediately raises international oil prices and it hurts China. Because it immediately raises which is why the administ- which is why the administration was so opposed to that. <laughs> because no, because the gas prices will increase. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think you're you're right. I mean, we we've seen the administration enormously sensitive. Uh, we, we see it in the uh, efforts over the last year, which may be ending uh, actually on the 18th, uh, to get some kind of deal with Venezuela. And there's been a six month lifting of sanctions to get more oil onto the market. They're very sensitive about oil prices um, and presumably would oppose such a move. Although, um, you know, if I were an Israeli, I think what I'd say if my interlocutor from Washington opposed it. So what's your idea? I want to I conclude uh, by looking at the dawn of a new Middle East that we saw unveiled on Saturday. We've been speaking, um, people in the policy community have been speaking for years about the sort of military partnerships that NATO represents among nations in the Middle East. And even without that formal infrastructure of of, uh, treaty obligations, nevertheless, what you saw in the interoperability and cooperation between these militaries with CENTCOM uh, relocating its command infrastructure to Israel and then uh, Jordanian, French, British, American, and Israeli militaries working together, and reportedly Saudi assets as well, you sort of think that there's something new that is happening here. Well, uh, yes and no. Um, For 45 years, Iran has been a very dangerous country for the United States, Israel, and our Arab uh, friends in the region. That is not new. Um, Our efforts to bring our friends together, as in the Abraham Accords, um, is not brand new. Um, The Gaza war seemed to have pushed them a bit apart, at least visibly, maybe not under the surface. But um, I think um, what's new here is a new calculation on the on the negative side of the to use were raise word recklessness and evil um, that's my word on the part of the regime in Iran and on the positive side an extraordinary response to that recklessness by if you will our side and in this potentially new Middle East um, Things could go one way or the other. It could be a new Middle East dominated by Iranian aggression, or it could be a new Middle East led by the United States and our friends and partners against Iran. And that outcome will depend largely on American leadership. Uh, I'll just say briefly, I agree with Elliot on evil. I'll, I'll not add it to the list, reckless and evil. Uh, Jonathan, I think the new release began on October 7th, because since October 7th, two things have happened that we did not anticipate. Hamas engaging in the attack that it did, and the Iranians doing what it did. Everybody was surprised by both. Yeah. So we have adversaries that are profoundly bolder, evil, and reckless. And they're all parameters within which our conflict with these adversaries played in no longer apply. The old assumptions don't exist, and I'm not quite sure what the new assumptions are. The old rules don't apply. I don't know what the new rules are. Uh, I do think, in addition to all the things that Elliot said, we have to have not just new way of thinking about these problems, but some kind of consensus in this country. Mm. Because we don't have that today. Uh, we don't have that within the within Democrats and Republicans. We don't have it between the Republicans. Yep. Uh, and I think in absence of that domestic consensus, it will be very difficult to have a sustained alliance system along the lines that Elliot is talking about. I, I would uh, just I think that's right. I would say that that, you know, 
American leadership, leadership by the United States, is going to depend on American leadership inside the country. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, but I think I, I think I would not say that the American people have a hard and fast view of the Middle East situation and what to do about it. And as Ray says, the parties are divided between themselves, and each party is divided internally. So. Uh, Predicting how that's going to come out, all of this, uh, I think that's right, all of this is uh, unknowable right now. And uh, a lot is at stake uh, in a way, one could say not instantly, but over the long run, viability is at stake for Israel, as many Israelis will tell you. A lot is at stake for the United States as well.